And actually in the last session, which was on gender, we kind of started talking, um, talking about this. Um, and it was actually brought up by one of the participants uh, here, uh, Mary Johnson, who, who teaches uh, in the UK. Um, and and um, we started talking about the importance of, of um, education, the role it plays in regards to kind of designing a more equitable city. Um, and so I think that was a good point to end in the last session. And I guess um, in talking about this session, um, I, I personally think that there's a lot to unpack when it comes to how architecture education is taught, um, especially for on an, <coughs> sorry, on the African continent. Um, I actually didn't study uh, architecture or urban planning in Nigeria, but I did study in South Africa for a bit. Um, but, I, but I think the main, um, a lot of the issues that I find are actually within the undergraduate. And this, this panel, we have um, Dr. Nezi Uduma Ulugu, and she is actually, um, oh, sorry, what's that? Oh, okay. Um, she's actually um, the HOD at uh, the University of Lagos in the architecture department. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Yakubu Aminu Dodo, who is also um, lecturing and teaching um, specifically in Malaysia. And I'll probably ask you to do a little bios of yourself uh, because as I said, I'm kind of thrown into this and I haven't um, we put together bios of each speaker. Um, and then we also have uh, Matthias, uh, Matthias Ago, who is a designer and researcher um, of the built environment. So I think before uh, we go into questions, um, I'll just ask each panelist to just do a quick introduction of themselves um, and, and then we'll go into questions. So um, I started with Dr. Nezi Uduma Ologu, so maybe you can just have about three, four minutes just to introduce yourself um, and so we know who you are. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for an opportunity to be part of this awesome panel. Um, I am Nezi Jumalugu, I'm an architect and a landscape architect. Um, I've been in practice and in lecturing for quite a while, and I am currently the head of the department of uh, architecture, University of Lagos. Um, I'm a first class scholar of the Canadian Commonwealth Scholarship and a fellow of the Society of Landscape Architects of Nigeria. Um, I, I have a book on landscape. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a chartered architect. Akon, um, I'm an Akon chartered architect for MNA. Uh, I have been both in practice and in lecturing, as I mentioned already. Uh, so it's quite an honor to be a part of this discussion because mentoring students and the education of uh, the architect or landscape architect is quite a major part for me. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here and I look forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nezi. Um, now, um, Dr. Yakubu Aminu Dodo, please, um, if you can just do a quick introduction um, as well. So I, I, uh, thank you very much, uh, Open House Lagos, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, given to me to share the little knowledge on the, the topic. I'm Yakubu Aminu Dodo. I, I did my BSc, MSc architecture at Madubedo University Zaria, and I did my PhD in architecture, specializing in green building design, uh, University Technology in Malaysia. And uh, before then, I, 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 did, uh, I taught in uh, Modibo Adama University of Technology, Yola, for five years before I engaged in my sojourn for my PhD in Malaysia in 2010. Between 2010 and 2014, I earned my PhD in green buildings and I taught in University Technology in Malaysia for three years, uh, from 2015 to 2018. From 2018 
to 2020, I, I taught in University Science, Islam, Malaysia. And uh, currently, I am uh, a staff, an assistant professor with uh, Istanbul Gelsin University, Turkey in Istanbul. I, before now, I used to practice in Nigeria. I had a small furniture company and uh, I used to work for one uh, Alibat firm in Lagos. I worked in Lagos for two years and then before I moved into the academics, I have uh, currently I am the head of a scientific committee for Wood Expo Nigeria. In Wood Expo Nigeria, we are trying to promote timber because timber is a versatile material. It's one of the most sustainable materials. So, and I'm into architectural education. And thank you, that is me. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jojo. And then um, we have Matthias. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Uh, my name is Matthias Abu Jr. Uh, I'm an architect. I've been uh, practicing for close to a decade. Uh, my specialty is actually the built environment. Uh, I focus more on uh, research and urbanism. I run uh, a design built consultancy here in Abuja. It's actually uh, a multidisciplinary team of architects, uh, engineers, and, um, and uh, uh, other associated designers. And over the last uh, five, six years, I've been uh, involved in all, all, all manners of design across the built environment, uh, mostly in urbanism, and how our architecture and uh, the built environment affects our social life. I've contribute, contributed to three uh, architecture books, uh, two already in print, uh, called Beyond Worst, uh, which was released uh, uh, a month ago. And um, yeah. So that's, that's, that's the most about me. Great, thank you so much, thank you so much. Um, so I think we'll just start, uh, and I'll, I'll start maybe asking um, Matthias a question. Um, do you think there is a problem with architecture education? Uh, you studied, did you study here in, in Nigeria? Um, and I, what, like, after doing that, have you been able to successfully work in the environment um, due to what you were taught? Uh, the, the problem with architectural education is not a Nigerian thing, neither is it an African thing. Uh, it's a global problem. If you, if you noticed, the Associ Association of uh, British Architecture Students had released a, an open letter last year where they were demanding that the profession needs to pay more attention to the social issues and ecological issues that uh, surround uh, our, that, that, were, that were confronted with. And so it, that, that we should go beyond just designing and building to actually uh, do something about all of this. And, and so I think it's not just a local problem. But for us here, we have a peculiar problem in the sense that we have deviated so much from uh, the norms of our, our social cultural uh, artifacts that. Um, at some point, we don't know what we're practicing because you were, we've modeled our educational system so much after the West that even when they are having problems, they, they're able to retrace their self and say, okay, this is where we had, uh, we're having problems. But for us here, uh, because we're trying to copy something, uh, we've discarded our cultural, uh, our, our cultural artifacts and we're studying Likubuzia, we're studying water groups and neglecting all the local uh, architecture. So I think we have a bigger problem. It's a global problem, but we have uh, a much bigger problem than anywhere else. Great, thank you. And I think um, I'm gonna change the question slightly, but it's still kind of on this, is there is there a problem uh, rhetoric? Um, doc, Dr. Um, Dodo, has architecture education become outdated? Is, is that something that is, is fundamentally an issue at the moment, or is there, are there other things? Is it outdated? I, if I may understand your question uh, vividly, I don't think it is, both in the Western world and in Nigeria as, as well. Uh, the only thing that if I say, I will do a comparison between, because I school in Nigeria and I worked in, uh, Malaysia, likewise in Nigeria, 
there is this part of education that we are currently, you know, on, uh, it's called the education 4.0. So what give back to education 4.0 is the industrial revolution, industrial revolution 4.0. And what is it all about? Industrial revolution 4.0 is talking about the kind of pedagogy we use in teaching our students, the curriculum. And if we look deeply into what uh, education 4.0, which has a link with uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0 is more into technology, is technologically inclined. We see where we have, uh, whereby the teaching method globally, what is practiced just before COVID-19 is called the blended learning. In this learning, students are made to, you know, some part of their lecture should be online about 20 to 30 percent, uh, the, the other percent will be face to face. So in this blended learning, you, we must play back in, in my university in, in Malaysia, we must blend this scenario. And the scenario is centered along technology. So what that's what the education 4.0 talks about is technology. And this technology is centered around being BIM, building information modeling. But the problem we have with uh, education 4.0 in Nigeria is that the architectural school, we still use manual drafting. In Malaysia, University of Technology in Malaysia, where I, I taught for three years, the first semester is where the students are encouraged to do manual drafting. They allow them to sketch. But the subsequent semester, they introduced them to uh, AutoCAD, Revit, other computer-aided design software that can enhance their design because the world now is digitalized. So the current uh, pedagogy is called a digital pedagogy, whereby it has to do with humans, technology, machine, and if I tell you, you'll be shocked that as we speak, the Japanese are already moving towards industrial revolution 5.0. They've gone beyond 4.0, but we are still battling with 4.0, like we in Malaysia and other places. But in Nigeria, we still draft manually. So you can see the gap. This we deny our students from competing with their counterpart globally, one, it will, you know, uh, they cannot they, uh, find job out there. Even if they should go into competition or else, the medium is technology. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Vildo. So, uh, yes, I'm hearing that there is a gap in regards to technology, and that is, and maybe that's not the only thing, but that is one of the things that is not allowing Nigerian young architects, students, graduates, uh, to compete in an international, on an international level. Um, I, I'd like to ask Dr. Nezi, and I think this is something that um, Matthias was, was touching on as well, in regards to um, a loss of identity or a crisis of culture. Um, you know, I, I think Matthias was, was saying uh, something about the fact that what is taught in terms of history, historic history of architecture in, um, and maybe I don't want to, to, to say, but in some universities in Nigeria, I don't want to say every university because I don't know every university um, or the curriculum, a lot of it is actually um, not necessarily local history uh, in terms of architecture. Um, and so my question is, is, is this true? I mean, maybe you can shed some light because you are uh, currently practicing in Nigeria. Um, is there a loss of identity in terms of looking at the history of architecture from a local context? And does this cause a crisis of culture? This is a very, very important uh, question. And um, it, it drives to the core of the issues that we are talking about. And in order for, for me to do justice to the response, 
I would like to move a little back to the architectural education history in Africa. Well, I would say that formal architectural education in Sub-Saharan Africa was established in the 1920s, initially in South Africa, then later in Kenya, and then Nigeria during um, 1950. And then uh, the first colonial schools in Ghana and Sudan were also inaugurated in around that uh, 1950, triggering debate on the form an architectural education should take for post-colonial Africa. For us in Nigeria, it started with uh, ABU, um, Zaria, which was started as uh, a, a Nigerian College of Science and Technology, Ibadan, and eventually became a full university in Zaria. And then other schools joined. Why I went this far is to say we have we have followed the history of the world. We have followed the history of education elsewhere, and we, we didn't just come upon it. And the world is becoming a global village where whatever you're doing now is impacting elsewhere. Of course, when they first came, uh, the people that first taught us architecture had to bring their own backgrounds and were teaching us these things. I, for one, when I went to school, um, I finished in UNN, 87, 89. We were taught both. We were taught both traditional architecture and we were also taught the history of architecture as, uh, in Europe and America and all that. They're still taught, being taught that now. Uh, but the emphasis is shifting. And as the question comes up more and more that, Architecture is an issue of culture. It actually says this is who we are. So from colonial times, when we had a lot of British people come and practice and teach and all that, to now when people that have been taught by them and people that have been taught by even those ones are the people teaching now. So there is truly a, a crisis of identity. Yes, even when you are taught that this is what happened um, during Gothic times or during Baroque and all that. But right here and now, this is what is happening in, in Nigeria. So architecture is a problem solving part where they give you a set of problems and by design you have to solve that problem. The problem is in Nigeria, we do not use the icons of Nigeria to solve the problem. We still go back to uh, the Western time and all that. And more and more, unless there is a balance, people always think that foreign is better, which is not necessarily so. So there is a crisis of identity. People actually keep saying, what is the Nigerian architecture? What is the African architecture? And so that continues uh, to go on. People are coming up and things are changing. But when you as an individual, which uh, is what architecture really is. It's an individual creative enterprise. As an individual, you may have good ideas, but you may meet with a client who says, I love Mr. Smith's house. Just reproduce something that looks like Mr. Smith. But his way of living is not Mr. Smith's way of living, and you try to convince the person. But now we're talking about the education. So let's come back to the education. Yes, they are being taught both the traditional Nigerian context as well as the global um, contemporary thing, what's happened in history and what is happening now. So yes, it's quite a problem. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Nezi. I'm sorry, my internet cut out, so I, I left briefly, so I missed a bit, um, but, but I caught up uh, towards the end. So thank you for that. Um, so with this crisis of culture, I'm wondering somewhat what, what is, is next? I mean, uh, there's, how, how do we regain identity? How do we rise over this, uh, become this kind of Af Afro-Pacific How do we change from um, this kind of colonial influence to kind of understanding more of uh, the local context 
Um, and I'm saying local context and not like an African context or because I, I think there's so many different cultures um, and, and different methodologies uh, in terms of building all over Africa. Um, so I, I think I'll, maybe I'll go back to, to Matthias and maybe you can, you can, I mean, have you had any thoughts about this? I know that you are not a practicing um, uh, educator at the moment, but have you thought about what we can, we can do to change uh, this? Yeah, for, for us, I think our problem is uh, two pronged. Well, one with the with the academia on one hand, another with the practice. So we we can teach the students one thing in school, and when they go, when they get their first jobs, they are made to unlearn everything they learned in school because their principal would not be practicing uh, the way they were taught. So uh, for any architecture education reform to work. The, the architecture industry as a whole must reform itself. Um, it is very important that we start going beyond designing, just designing building to actually x-ray all the social uh, issues in our societies around any, any piece of design. I'll give an example. Uh, you, go, you go around Abuja now and you don't find street, uh, you don't have to find street hawkers in certain neighborhoods, but they are needed. And so you find uh, their wares being destroyed and they're being sent out of these, out of their, their locations and all. But that is who we are. We, you want you to go out of the house and then you buy something by the local kiosks around and all. So we need to find a way to incorporate all of these elements into, into our design. And one thing we also need to learn again is, uh, for us, it should never be about just the building. You should understand how a building addresses uh, the street, how the street fits into the neighborhood, how the neighborhood fits into a city. And I think that is what we're not doing. Urbanism is a very core part of architectural practice and unfortunately it's not happening here. So it's a, it's a very, for us, a very complex problem. In the West, uh, the biggest problem we have is an ideological problem where you have uh, modernist architects against classical architects and traditionalists. So because of their ways, traditionalists are more, they are a lot more open to uh, taking into consideration all of the urban nuances in all of their designs. But for us, there is no, there is none of those. There is no thoughts that goes into any of the design. So you give me a plot, I just design for that plot, and I go away. And I don't bother about what happens in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, we also have our kinds at the development control agencies and the city planning agencies, and so they also just go through the motions, and it's just a cookie cutter uh, approach all over the city. So it's a, it's a huge mess uh, that should start from practice, then to uh, the academia. Thank you so much. And actually, I'm going to just link all these questions together because I think you know it's 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 quite good. So I'm going to take off from where where you where you ended there, um, Matthias, and and ask uh, Dr. Dodo a question. How do we then uh, how do we then kind of educate or change the system to be able to educate in this way? In terms of an architect uh, has to understand that there are social aspects to their work. And those social aspects are not just about the building they're building, but the environment they're creating through that building. So, um, yeah, so how, how do we do that? And is that something that you're doing in your own, uh, in your own work? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Nazi for that. You know, she delves back into history of architecture, how architecture came to Africa still we still you know teach in a curriculum that i believe since i was in the school have not been amended a curriculum that has not been amended you know as time flies as time goes by we find out that a lot of things are happening around you especially with technology that's one so but the simple answer because i like to go back and forth the simple answer is that there are three things that we can do and which I tell you, there are a lot of move, movements already globally and locally and in the national level. There are a lot of movement to see how can we can revive architectural uh, education in Nigeria. But these three things I want to make sure. Number one is awareness. Just like Matthias Ago just uh, mentioned, we need to, you know, there's this, uh, we need to create this awareness among ourselves as uh, lecturers, awareness amongst the students of the main core value of architecture. If you find out from time immemorial, from 
the early man, architecture will always be in the man built uh, in the cave. We talk about the Egyptians, you know, they built to solve solutions. So if we really want to solve our problem of architecture in Nigeria, we have to, you know, create that awareness. It's good to study, to teach history of uh, the, the, the colonial history. Like, like myself, I used to teach back in Mautech, Modibo Adama University of Technology, Yola. I used to teach history. But the first three history classes we teach is Egypt, Greece, and Rome. That is how the curriculum is. Egypt, Greece, and Rome. Then the next uh, uh, architecture is African traditional architecture. Then Af uh, all architectures follows. So as I speak, we need to, you know, create this awareness on what architecture is, uh, really is then. The other thing has to do with technology. To do with technology. And uh, the, the third one has to do with policy. Number one is awareness, technology, then policy. I'll just quickly take them one after the other. Like awareness, in issue of awareness, I tell you, the architect and association of architectural educators in Nigeria, I'm telling you, they are doing wonderful. Being led by Professor Musa Lawa Sagada, uh, just during the COVID, they started, you know, thinking of how to move architecture to take architecture to a global standard. So the series every two weeks, they invite those uh, to come and contribute to see how we can take architecture to the next level. That's on the uh, national level, being uh, led by Professor ML Sagada. Archis is doing that, bringing all architects together to see how, how, can we can, how can we improve in our curriculum. Then there is this movement by CPDI. I don't know if you've heard of CPDI. CPDI. CPDI is a, a community planning and design institute, which is uh, uh, being, uh, you know, by it's been uh, the founder of this institute. She has been working for over ten years. She's, uh, I think, she's in the forum. Uh, Professor Madili Akumaba. I tell you, she has been. You know, in the forefront, trying to, you know, educate interns on the need for Afrocentric architecture. She has been doing this for over ten years now, and I think she has come to limelight because uh, uh, this year I joined as uh, one of the guest uh, lecturer, and uh, what we the, the result was, I tell you, wonderful. I, I believe uh, architect. Uh, uh, Professor Madili might want to share some of our, uh, our talk later. But at that global level, in January, we'll be starting the Global Studio, CPDI Africa Global Studio, for teaching African centered architecture. You can see there's already a movement. This is global. In, in another aspect, you will talk about culture just now, Matthias. I tell you, there's something that we need to do. We need to go into what we call the Nigerian architectural identity. We need an identity. But back in our school then, one of my professor, Professor W.B. Curis, some of his research work has to do with the Nigerian architecture. So there are pockets of researchers who have been working on this, but what we need to do is to consolidate most of this work, and I will tell you, CPDI is doing uh, a great work. Then number three is the issue of uh, policy. I tell you, you cannot do anything, what, even if you have all it takes, if you don't have the right policy in, policy in place. So we need policies that will allow us to move on with what architecture is supposed to be. I, I give you an example. Globally, there is a serious movement on designing green buildings, which is one of my, my area of specialties. And I tell you, as we speak, we will have few, maybe one or two green buildings in Nigeria. They are not up to 10. Uh, I think I have the, the record. So these green buildings are supposed to be buildings that will help in uh, reducing the effect of climate change. 
Green buildings are buildings that has to do with localities, it has to do with culture. But as I speak, we need policy to move that. So three things in all. One is we create awareness among ourselves, the client, the populace, everybody. We need to know what architecture is supposed to be like. Number two, technology. We have to know how to go about technology. When I say technology, I'm talking about two things. One, the technical know-how using software and the technology to build. Then the other one is policy. I think with these three things, we can, you know, kickstart and, you know, and be there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dodo. Um, I'm going to hand back to Chuka now. Um, as I said, he had an emergency earlier, so he wasn't able to, to um, start the session with us. So I'm going to hand the baton over to him as the uh, official moderator of this session. So over to you, Chuka. We've only just started kind of uncovering, um, you know, what are the issues with architecture education? And, and as um, Dr. Dodo has started, what, what can we do to make the changes? Right. Okay. Sorry about sorry about this whole thing. Um, have have they have have the panelists been properly introduced? Yes, we've done an introduction. Everybody's been introduced. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, hello, everybody. I'm so sorry about this sort of um, mix up. Um, I don't know, I think I can jump in. I, 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 have, I have sort of communicated with the panelists previously. So um, I think they've got a fair idea what um, I, I might have been wanting to talk with them about. Um, and um, I thought if I look at my list, um, the way I wrote it, um, I started off with something called um, origin of design education in Nigeria. And um, I think I wanted that to be started off by um, Nezi, who's um, the head of architecture department at the University of Lagos. I don't know so if- We've done all of that. We're on Afro, Afro Afrocentricism okay. and Afropolitics. Regaining identity? Yes. 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 That's, we're in that direction, yes. Okay. Okay, fine. Okay. I actually wrote Africa-centrism as opposed to Afrocentrism because um, Afrocentrism might have a bit of um, sort of like um, Black American, African American connotation um, uh, and may not be referring particularly to Africa um, in, in, in the real sense. So um, you could take that Africa centrism or Afrocentrism, it will depend on how you want to take it. But um, yes, what, what this regaining our, our identity. Um, um, have we started discussing that? Not yet? Yes, yes, we've started discussing that. That's kind of where we are at right now. Okay, okay. Who hasn't spoken? <laughs> this is really... Uh, has anyone... Everyone, everyone has spoken. Maybe Dr. Nezi can say something at this point. Okay, please. And then we can move on to the next topic. Uh, okay. Um... Welcome, sir, and uh, we are very sorry to hear about your health emergency. I hope you're feeling much better. Yes, Good I'm, yeah, to have yes. you. Yes, yes. Um, on the subject we are talking about, I had actually spoken about the history of um, architectural education coming into Africa, coming into South Africa, coming to Kenya, Ghana, and eventually arriving in Nigeria, and uh, how much the colonialists did and the people trained by them and all that. And architecture is the same as the culture of the people. We are not very different from how we build. And the same problems that we have as a people, we often still have when we build as well. Because a, a, a Nigerian man would rather wear a suit than wear the additive thing. So the attraction for Western ideas, the attraction of other things that are not African, that are not Nigerian, is higher, often higher. But following uh, local trends or following international trends, there seems to be a resurgence in um, how people 
value themselves or their Africanness, as it were, from our music, from our Nollywood, from our fashion, etc. It seems that like people are getting more interested once more in being in being African. So there is a resurgence of understanding what really what it really means to be African. Now, in terms of music and all the other things I mentioned, it's easier to do, but to build as uh, as architect, it's not so easy. We talk about the materials, we talk about the technology, we talk about the ways of building. Um, uh, we have explained much of that. Uh, a lot of the town hall meetings, uh, which I have quite attended by NIA, by Archies. Archies is the architectural educators and all that. We have been talking about it. It's not that it is recent, but there is a resurgence of the need to find the identity of the African or the Nigerian in the way they build. But you can't use a mud building to do a skyscraper. As we know that architecture is a design-based, is a solution-based uh, uh, profession. You have a set of problems and you're trying to solve it. You want to house 1,000 people and you have a minimum amount of space to house them in. So right away, you must use a particular technology, you must use a particular kind of materials, you have to do this and do that, and also integrate the current trends in architecture now, going green and all that. So it's a difficult thing. And as individuals, as architects, we are still trying to understand it, not to talk about being able to transfer it to the students. So in, in terms of, the architectural education, it will still have to come down to the curriculum, infusing that, which really is not easy in Nigeria to change curriculum because anything you want to change, apart from changing it within the uh, senate of the university, you must also carry along ACON, you must carry along NIA, you must carry along quite a bit. So I think we are in the process of trying to do all that. But uh, as they say, a problem identified is a problem half solved. So we are moving, I would say, in the right direction. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I think um, because we're sort of running out of time, um, I would like to deal with one more topic, Afropolitanism. Um, and I, I want, I don't know who... Um, I think um, I, I can ask um, Matthias to start, um, if he may, talk about that um, topic um, as regards um, a way to, to fashion architectural ed education in Nigeria and also Africa as a whole. Um, that, 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 that title, um, is it something that we can Used to advance education, um, the, the 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 you know the the um, the um, basically the thoughts that we don't need to necessarily be against pro, um, a progressive movement in African and Nigerian architecture, but really, but to take our place in a global environment, is is this something that we can? used to advance education? I, I think when we speak about uh, reforming architecture education, it's very important that we know exactly what we're setting out to do. Um, beyond the uh, building typology, we, my, one of my chief concerns is also uh, the social cultural implications of whatever we do as uh, designers. So uh, just like our Prof said, we, we can't, uh, our brief, the design, the design brief we, we, we do have here might not be able to accommodate uh, traditional African uh, architecture holistically. But what is most important is that whenever we design, we take note of uh, the social realities uh, in, in the country. Now on, uh, we're designing, are we designing just for the middle class? Are we designing just for the rich? How do we incorporate uh, low income neighborhoods into our design? Are we designing for disabled people? Are we designing for able people? Also, it's, it's all of this put together for me that, uh, that uh, 
would define what actually an Afropolitan design is. Uh, yeah, Afropolitan design. How does that each? How does the design we do situate itself in our society? So that's the most important. So beyond building typology, I think it would be tyranny for us to insist that we must have uh, all buildings uh, uh, designed and built uh, like tradi in traditional African style. Uh, Mr. A might want to have a Georgian villa, Mr. B, a contemporary glass, glass box, and we can't deny them that. But as designers, we, my core concern is how do we situate all of this practice within, our, within the social realities of our, of our society? Are we contributing to uh, what is happening? Are we, or are we solving problems? If you look at uh, our region in the past was about low-income neighborhoods that were demolished and then off-scale houses were built there. Could we have done things differently? So uh, that's for me is my focus. Thank you. Um, um, I'll go to Yakubua because I know he's in academia um, and ask him again, same thing. You know, can we, do we, can we not move forward um, in African architecture? Um, I, I see a lot of talk about going back to our roots and I'm worried that it is 2020 and not even 1970, not to talk of 1855. And really, are we, should we be, uh, are we in the danger of moving backwards? And is it actually impossible to move backwards anyway? Because modern technology and life has moved on. It's now, it's, 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 it's you know, the global situation means that there's very little difference between a man in Lagos and a man in Tokyo. There really is very little difference in value. Um, how, how, do we, how do we deal with that? And how do students have to be taught to be ready to deal with it? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, uh, well, first, what I would like to say is, it all boils down to, like I said, there are three things. In such an instance, uh, we should look at the awareness. When we're talking about awareness, when we want to design, we don't just design, we need a brief. We're not, we not like artists in the architectural profession. It is artists that just do a script of art or make a sculpture and somebody will come and get inspired. And by, but for the architecture profession, what you get first is a brief, the client brief. So in the client brief is what we translate into the actual design. And the architect stand a better chance to convince his or her client on what is ideal in terms of quality, in terms of money, in terms of aesthetics. The architect has that power. Although some, some clients are well-traveled, they want to, you know, tell you, know, I saw this, but as an architect, you can find a way of letting your client know that this is, you know, to convince your client to go in a particular direction. If we look at uh, the, the topic, the, the, the main topic, you just, this particular one, Afropolitanism, which has to do with uh, placing emphasis on the ordinary citizen. When, when we say ordinary citizen, we have to talk about architecture that reflect, architecture that reflect, architecture that touch them, architecture that, you know, so I go to one of the architects known in history from Egypt, architect Asan Fati. Architect Asan Fati is known for his work, architecture for the poor. He has used the knowledge he has acquired to design for the poor in Egypt. So why can't, he be, why can't we replicate the same in our beloved nation? Another similar architect is uh, architect Geoffrey Bauer. Is, although he's from the Asia, but I want to take a leap from what he has done. We all know what modernism is, but what Geoffrey Bauer did was to, you know, to inject uh, uh, the, the tropical content into modernism. I became the father of tropical modernism. So this has to do with design. So like I said, it has to do with awareness. We need to create awareness. Then in awareness, we need to talk about our curriculum. How do we address our curriculum? How do we teach our students? From the curriculum, we boil down, it boils down to the pedagogy. 
So what are the pedagogy we have been using to teach our students? How can our, our students, by the time they get out there, they can address source issue? So the, the, there are two scenarios. One is uh, the, the, the project-based learning and the problem-based learning. So if we use the project-based learning, this in teaching our students, if we adopt this as a pedagogy, this can help the student because when we talk about the project-based learning, it assists the student to learn in a complete real world, not in a virtual world. Because most of the time, if not uh, during during my days in school, I think it was in the first, um, apart from the bus station that we were asked to design, but at the master's level, that's when we do the live project. With the live project is similar to the project uh, the problem-based learning. So most, uh, most of the, the curriculum and the pedagogy we used in teaching in Nigeria, before I left Nigeria in 2010, was all mostly pro project-based learning, which is teaching method. Uh, the student gains skills in working in an extended period of time. But that of the problem-based learning, if we adopt one of these uh, problem-based learning as a pedagogy, it sees the student immersed in the real-life scenario I give example. We want to design or want to renovate uh, Ami Barak. We want to design for certain uh, people. We bring this, this scenario to school. So there is this gap between practice and uh, and and, and uh, the education. So there should be that synergy between practice and education. So there should be this, you know. So the practice, the, the education, the educators need to bring in. Those practitioners, a, a simple scenario. In UTM, where I teach, uh, or rather where I used to teach, if we are to do a certain project that involves services and fire and safety, we bring the guys from the fire department and those service engineers, they are the ones who assess our students. We integrate them to teach. So it now boils down to the pedagogy we need to adopt. And this pedagogy that we need to adopt, we cannot just bring this pedagogy except we change our curriculum. And the curriculum need to be changed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think it would be good to, um, there's a question from Mary, from Mary Johnson, um, very interesting. Um, because it sort of ties in with one one of our last topics, which is you know about technology really. And she says, I have a question regarding technology. In this case, Western technology, which finds its roots in modern science. There seems to be an assumption that technology is acultural or without culture. So could the panel please speak to this? In other words, is it possible to separate technology from culture? Um, does anybody want to go or anyone on the panel? Okay, can I go? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because nobody is. <laughs> or <Well>, Matthias. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can go and then I'll, I'll probably go after that. Okay, okay, Matthias want to say something. I, I just spoke, you know. Let me, yeah. Matthias would like to say something, I guess. I think it depends on, I think it depends on the nature of the technology. Uh, because sometimes uh, technology has also enhanced the local cultures we have here. So uh, technology on its own is not a bad thing, uh, but it must not interfere with, with uh, subsisting uh, culture. Because some of these cultures are even intangibles. So uh, if maybe this is not a good example, but that's what comes to mind. If uh, you wake up in the morning and the practice is to call uh, your father to greet him, uh, Sorry, to go to go to your father's room and say good morning to him. And then you move out of the house with a phone. You can easily call every morning to say good morning. I don't know if it's a very good analogy, but uh, there are ways which uh, technology could also help um, underpin our, our culture, so long as it's not interfering with uh, the, way, the way we live our lives. And all. So I think it should make life easier for people. OK. Um, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting question, I think, um, because I have actually pondered on that, on, on that relationship between culture and technology. And I, I sort of see technology as the reason why the last question I asked, which was about 
in 2020, are we not going to think of a more progressive, forward moving, I wouldn't say forward thinking, forward moving African architecture, Nigerian architecture even, um, and the influence on that would be technology, obviously, um, and how it would change the way we, 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 we design, or, or, or sorry, affect the way we design. Um, what I see really is that, um, more importantly, it's not the visual of African design, not in 2020. I think it's the characteristics of space, the manipulation of space, and also the, um, the you know, sort of like the reinterpretation of the, of the qualities and relationships between spaces that existed in the past in African architecture and therefore reimagining it in, new, in a new way. So dressing it in new clothes. And that is something that I think is very important to um, progressing our, our course. Um, I know, I mean, you were mentioning CPDI um, and other people who are very much into this um, 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 movement. And, you know, I sort of see this as something that um, technology, that's the way technology could be brought in. It would just be to interpret old ways, the old spaces, the old relationships, and on all that. I don't know if um, Madili would want to say anything about that. Yeah. All right. Is. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Prof, we okay. can hear you. <laughs> All right. I want to say um, congratulations on this, on this forum. This is a very timely conversation. Uh, it's been very good listening to everyone, Professor Dodo, Architect Chuka, Matthias, of course, um, Professor Nezi also, everyone that's on. I can see, see some of my CPDI interns here as well. Uh, but it's a very timely conversation. Um, when Professor Nezi said that the very first thing is to acknowledge that there is a problem, then we, we're kind of halfway there. Um, and it's very true, um, Professor Dodo, you said I've been, I've been on this for actually a couple of decades, um, trying to bring this conversation, of course, first of all, to Nigeria, being a Nigerian, yes, I'm, I might be outside right now, but this conversation for me, African architecture, Nigerian architecture, or in my case, Igbo architecture, would have to start in my own homeland. So this this query with my fellow built environment professionals started um, 25 years ago, trying to engage designers on ground, um, trying to engage them in this conversation. What are we really supposed to be teaching in our schools there? What are we really supposed to be building? Are we really supposed to be trying to create um, a Eurocentric version of Africa in Africa? Or could it be a modern version of Africa in Africa? And what would that be? You know, uh, architecture really is people's culture and their aesthetics and their local materials and their indigenous technology translated in the built environment. So what is ours? You know, and so if we were to focus on that in our schools, of course, in our practice, then I think Nigeria or Africa would look a lot different. You know, you talk about um, problem-based architecture in schools. What are the problems that we're facing on ground? We should really be teaching that in school as opposed to what's going on in the West and how they solve their problems. It's how do we solve ours, right? And our ancestors were not off point. They, they had science and, and technology that worked for their local environment. And so all we have to do is build upon that. Um, and, and there will not be, there's not one African language. It's going to be very diverse, right? So many ethnic groups, whether you're on the continent or you're a diaspora and African, all is African. So what's our view? What's our take? And if we bring that into school and people you know, talk about that from high school to undergrad, master's, PhD, when you come out, you are an expert in solving problems in your own community. Um, when my professor's here, and I know I'm, I'm outside, but 
fellow designers in Nigeria and Africa tell me the same thing. When your professor tells you that Africa has nothing to contribute, it's very painful. Um, we have a lot to co contribute. We're not monkey see, monkey do, which is how I interpreted that when my professors told me to keep quiet, that as a black woman, as a Nigerian, I have nothing to contribute to what's going in, on in class in the design brief. My European and my Asian classmates had the right to bring their culture to the table. That cannot be allowed. Whether you're in a school in Africa or you're a school in, in a school in, in, in outside of Africa. So we really do have to focus on who we are and bring our full story to the table. So I am very pleased, I'm very impressed, I'm very happy that Nigeria is finally championing this conversation. What should our curricula be? What should we be teaching in our schools? What should we be building? That Nigeria is tackling this now, it's, it's incredible. So I'm, I'm really proud, I'm really pleased with what I'm seeing here and I really support all that you do. And with the CPD Africa Global Studio, we are looking for professors to come in and share that story to students and architects around the world who want to hear Africa's voice. They want to hear the sustainable technologies and solutions that Africans have had so that they can help solve world problems. So we want to hear from us. So I'm hoping that I will get a lot of professors and architects from Nigeria who will join our platform and continue such similar platforms around the con you know, Nigeria and the continent and getting our voice to the table and, and solving world problems. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to Mary Johnson who asked the question in the first place regarding culture and technology so that she could um, shed a bit more light on it. Um, she spoke in an earlier um, uh, um, um, talk and um, she heads the architecture department at Kingston School of Arts. Um, and she has some African roots. And uh, because I know when she comes on, you will not, you, you will not know that she is, um, um, she, she, she is very well qualified to see. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, so, I really right. appreciate that. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, thank you for giving me the floor. Although I'm, I'm even more intrigued by Nana's query, which I think is even more important, but I will just uh, respond very briefly to, to my question because my concern having been raised in, in Africa and then being educated in the US um, and now being an educator and heading a school of, of architecture that is predominantly, we have about 60% students who are non-white and what, I'm, and what I'm finding is that our education and our curriculum is not actually responding to their um, cultural experiences. So they're not able to contribute from their own experiences and don't really have a voice. And so Nana and I worked on a project last year with two other colleagues um, where we took students to Ghana. And the purpose of that, that uh, studio was to shift the lens so to get away, to remove ourselves from a Eurocentric education and to start to look um, from a perspective that's from another culture to try to, to critique that Eurocentric education. And I think, I think it's a problem uh, and I, I'm really happy and, and again, privileged and thank you for giving me this platform to speak, but I'm really excited about what's happening in Africa because you know when I, when I left and from, from colleagues and people that I knew, I, I was aware that education in Africa was still very Eurocentric and it's exciting to see what's happening. And I think it's something that's a lesson to the West more than anything else. I think it's something we need to heed uh, from the West and, and be more attentive to. But I'd like to now turn to students because if there are any students in the room, I agree with Nana, I think the young generation has a lot more to say than we're giving them uh, space for. And, and I'd like to, to offer that space to them here and see if there's anything they would like to, if I, I'm, I'm taking advantage here. So sorry, Chuka, but I think, I think it's, a great, it's a great opportunity to include the student voice here as well. 
Yes, uh, yes, yes. That, that's good calling us out like that. So um, <laughs> if any is, are there any students who would want to, to make a comment, to make any comments before I ask the panelists to round up? I don't see any hands up. No, no, okay. It, in our universities, since uh, the pandemic, we've been asked to give three minutes to allow students to respond because it takes them a little bit right. of time. <laughs> All right. Are there any students in there? It really would be great to hear from you. Well, hi, everyone. Oh, hi. Yeah, Laulgan here. Yeah, um, Laulgan, yes. Dr. Nezi mentioned something about um, presenting something to NI and Alcon, sort of like a, a curriculum review. And just to sort of channel what Mary was saying, why aren't there students on these panels? At least we know the best for us so much. We, we're more familiar with these softwares and everything, everything you mentioned. So why aren't there students on these panels? Thank you. Well, technically, um, even though the title is about education and therefore about students, but students are taught by teachers. So technically, the panel will evidently be made, made up, you know, more or less of teachers. And um, they would be expected to have, um, you know, had feedback from the students in the first, you know, generally as they teach, um, the experience is there and they come with, you know, they, they're the ones who could, you know, work out ways to change things. So, Chuka, I, don't I think, think I... I didn't, I didn't frame, uh, the, it was more of a comment than a question. Uh -huh, what, because... what, what she said was um, they're still struggling to sort of grapple with the, the new uh, changes, sort of the, the fourth industrial revolution and all of that. So why don't you have people who already, like we already do these things in our spare time when you're not teaching us. Why don't you just have us on the panels and we'll sort of lead you through it? Lead, lead through what? Through what? I, I'm sorry, maybe I missed that bit. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what? Yeah, I must what, have. Yeah. I, can she sort of reply? Maybe she gets uh, what I'm trying to say. Okay, we hand over to to, to her then, um, and see if she has anything to to add. Is that is that to me? No, it's to um, um Dr. Nezi. They, they, it's to Dr. Hi, Nezi. Yes. Who I actually would really like to hear from actually on this on this. I think I'll just reach out to her after this. Yes, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, okay, I'll try and uh, round up now with the panelists. Um, um, I think one, one after the other, we can just do a one minute um, round up statement, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Nezi again. And then we'll take Yakubu and then Matthias. We've got, okay, yes, she's here. Okay, uh, Yakubu, can you go ahead and then Matthias and then we'll come back to Dr. Nezi. All right, thank you for, uh, and uh, at this point in time, based on what we have discussed so far, uh, like uh, I have suggested, we have three core things that we, we need to look into. Awareness, and we talk about awareness, it has to do with awareness uh, among ourselves, awareness, the client on, the need to move this, to, 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 uh, to, to make sure that we sustain Afrocentric uh, architecture. But, you know, there's this aspect of life that you never change things by fighting the existing reality. But what you can do is to change something by building a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So we need a new curriculum. We need new pedagogies that we enhance that, that this curriculum uh, well, you know, uh, you know, uh, established. And uh, then 
the issue of technology. Technology is something that I believe that we cannot shy away because we we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution, we're talking about technology. But there was this aspect about the fourth industrial revolution that make uh, some other nations start thinking of the fifth industrial uh, re revolution. The fourth industrial revolution has to do with uh, IT, computer, you know, it is the same era that brought in the use of uh, beam, the use of VR, AR, and Miss Reality. But all these things put together, definitely we can unnest this technology, but we have to make this technology ours. We have to invite, I give example, like if you go into a typical BIM software, it's difficult for you to get like uh, quantities or other things that has to do with, uh, in the library, that has to do with African or Nigerian architecture. But if we, you know, based on this awareness and people go into such aspect of research, we can, you know, have this technology, unless it and make it ours. Then the other issue is policy. Whatever awareness we have created, whatever policy that is being, um, whatever uh, technology that we have, if we don't have the policy to allow you to operate, I tell you, we are in a zero. But we need, we really need policy that will give us enable environment to practice architecture, to embrace, you know, this movement of Afrocentric architecture. Thank you. Okay, I think I, I think can Maisie you, is back. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yes. Okay, excellent. I was I was actually trying to respond to him when my um, technology went down, which is me really <laughs> <we're> talking about. <laughs> and I didn't say we wouldn't involve students. Um, in Unilag, I run an open door system. And the students have access to me and they have access to uh, directly and through their um and through their class reps and all that before i take major steps i usually call one or two and say what do you think about this nobody has is a repository of knowledge by themselves and as he mentioned quite correctly he the younger ones are very much in tune with the technology but what i was saying was even when you decide that it, this is the way to go, to pass through the change, the processes to get to that change is where the problem is. Of course, one must hear the students' uh, part of it. When I thought I was going to be able to share my screen, I have something that I have done, and part of it has to do with students' intake, students' creativity, students' transitioning from whatever they have been taught from uh, student life to professional, to becoming a professional, and then being able to move with the trend. Because I know, for instance, there are some, some schools where they are still insisting that they should draw with hand. But this is not so in, in my school. I'm not boasting about the school, but I'm saying, you know you're taught to draw with the hand, but you must also move with the technology. Because if you don't move with the technology, you'll be left far behind. And the current trends like BIM, like green building, et cetera, those are things that are current, which must be imputed into the students and which the students must understand and be able to not just try it out while they're in school, but also be able to use it when they're out of school. Then down to, is anything wrong with education? Yes. There is something wrong with it. We have to learn how to, as Madly said, bring our philosophies into it. And as Mary said, translate the philosophies through uh, available technology into what makes sense. It cannot be copying the Western world. It has to be our own homegrown African solution. It doesn't then mean we should go back to mud houses either, but the technology that they had that kept those uh, uh, traditional buildings warm in the in the south and you know cool in the north and the kind of flat roofs they had up in the north, you will see that there was a lot more thinking to it. It wasn't just 
um, a native kind of thing. So we still have to understand the philosophy and find a modern language, a modern way of transiting into uh, contemporary problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that leaves us with Matthias to make a comment. Yeah, it's been a it's been a very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the issues are so vast that you can't cover this uh, all of it under an hour. I'm reading quite a bit about the different uh, issues uh, in the built environment, in architecture, and in urbanism, and probably uh, most of them come up as a uh, insightful reads, and probably um, some of our uh, participants can read them afterwards. But uh, nonetheless, uh, all of this is not an indictment on our educators. If, in spite of the circumstances, they found themselves uh, paucity of uh, funds, and, uh, facil poor facilities, and all they've, they've done their, their best. Uh, I also uh, want to encourage students to read widely, uh, read outside the outside the, the the field of architecture uh, as much as possible, so as to enhance uh, their knowledge. Uh, their problem solving capacity because for the architect, his drawing skills for me isn't, isn't uh, his prized asset, his ability to solve problems. And it's very important when we sing praises of technology, we must also understand that technology is just a tool. And I will take a good designer who cannot uh, use AutoCAD over one who, a draftsman who uses AutoCAD. And permit me to uh, read. Uh, to read uh, this pattern quote from uh, Walter Gropius in his 1937 uh, interview with Arc Record when he was appointed uh, to Harvard uh, Rabbi School of Design. He said, I want a young architect to find his way in whatever circumstances. I want him independently to create true genuine forms out of the technical, economic, and social conditions in which he finds himself, instead of imposing a learned formula onto surroundings which may call for entirely different solutions. It would be an absolute horror for me if my appointment will result in the multiplication of a fixed idea of Gropius architecture. I do what I want is to make young people realize how inexhaustible the means of creation are if they make use of the innumerable uh, products our age offers. Thank you. Meet myself. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everyone, the panelists who um, supported Open House with their presence and their contributions. And then um, thank you to those who made comments, especially the, those in the academia who spoke from the audience. Um, I have to thank Olamide, um, my co-Open House um, board member, um, for covering for me. Um, I have to apologize again for what happened at the start of the eve of, of this evening. Um, thank you very much. And um, I think with this,